Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to everybody in the room. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, during this presentation, I will be asking you to take part in the chat. So let me just test that you can see the chat. You can see me and hear me. Just say hello or tell me what you had for breakfast, um, just so that I know that the chat is working. Uh, we've got a few people saying hello, a few people, uh, no breakfast yet. I'm sorry, Adriana. Okay. Uh, a few names I recognize. Very nice to see people. Bavna's just had lunch. Marjorie's just still finishing breakfast. What are you having for breakfast, Marjorie? Um, so nice to see a few people. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. This talk is going to be slightly interactive. I'm going to ask you to do things in the in the chat box. And I know that we have a live stream on Facebook as well. Uh, so feel free to add your comments into the Facebook live stream. Marjorie's having coffee with steam milk. Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to get going. This talk is called 10 Secrets That No One Ever Tells You About Materials Writing. And the idea is this, that when we train to be teachers, we do a teacher training course, we maybe take a degree, we maybe do a CELTA or a diploma, but nobody really trains us how to write materials. And um, sorry, we're live streaming on YouTube, I need to tell you. Not, I'm not sure if we're on Facebook as well, but we're certainly live streaming on YouTube. No one tells us how to create our own materials, and yet it's an important part of what we do um, as teachers. We make materials all the time. So I'm, in this session, I'm going to share with you a few tips, a few ideas, some things you've probably learnt from doing it already, you've made your own materials, um, so you're already familiar with certain things, but I'm going to formalise it and look at why certain things are important. And I'm hoping also to give you some new ideas. I'm going to define what we mean by materials. Um, I'm going to talk about why we do the things we do when we create materials. And I'm also going to talk about how we can do it, how we can improve our materials and think more critically about them. Uh, on the opening slide, you can see my website. I also have a YouTube channel which has some tips, some video tips on writing materials. So I'll give you the link uh, again at the end uh, to that. So you can, you can look at some more ideas afterwards and pick up on some of the themes that I've been uh, talking about. And I'm hoping there'll be time for questions at the end. We'll finish it around 10 o'clock my time, so in about 55 minutes. Um, but I'll, I'll leave some time for questions if you've got specific questions. Feel free to comment or ask questions as we go along in the uh, chat box. 
Um, don't be afraid to put in questions or comments as we go. It makes it so much easier and more interesting for me if we continue kind of a conversation as we go. Let's, uh, let's get going with uh, tip number one. I've called them secrets. They're more like tips, really. One of the things that I think teachers quite often don't do is they don't define their material. So on the slide there, you can see tip number one, you've got to define your material. Let me just ask you something. In the chat box, can you write what was the last piece of material that you wrote for your students? What were you asked to write? It might have been a test. It might have been a short book. It might have been a reading comprehension, an essay somebody wrote. Yeah, okay. What else? What are other materials did you write? What sort of activity? When we say an activity, what activity? A certain type of test, a test of what? A quiz, vocabulary, fill in the banks, a gap fill. Yep. Yeah. Exercise on idioms, a leading task, Rachel, a listening task, Maria. Vocabulary from Marjorie, Mehmood wrote an essay, test. Okay, what I'm getting at here, it's really important to be able to define what, because we talk about material, but what does that mean? A piece of material in the classroom. Um, I've put on screen typically some of the types of things that we call materials and that we're asked to do. Um, we're getting grammar activity in the chat box, narrative writing test, but progress test, worksheet, fill in the blank exercise, gap fill exercise, exam. As teachers from day one, we start writing materials. It's just an everyday thing that teachers have to do. Um, but we don't receive much training in it. And we kind of learn through trial and error. We try out an activity um, and sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it works with one class, but it doesn't work with another class. But if we want to define these materials, we can put them into three categories, basically. If you think of the classroom, we have the learners, the teacher, and then we have materials, which is the third part of the whole. And we often talk about teachers and learners, but we don't spend much time talking about materials. Um, but when we categorize materials, we can categorize them into three ways. We can talk about in-class materials. So this might be the course book that you take into class. It might be a, a mingling activity. Margarita's just put in the chat, a find someone who, that would be in-class material. And it's usually it's material that's used both by the teacher and by the student. And this difference is important because it's material that the teacher will use with the student. So the way we write it is different from, for example, self-study material. And self-study material is the material that we write that is only used by the learners. And there's a big difference between in-class materials, self-study material. And one of the biggest mistakes that teachers make is that they will write material for their classroom that actually looks more like self-study material. By that, a self-study material, for example, needs to be more simple so that students can use it on their own. It might be even in the instructions, we translate them into the student's first language. Whereas in-class materials should in generate communication and interaction between students. But the mistake that teachers make, sometimes they write kind of self-study type materials, but use them in class. They are not the same. The third category uh, are teachers' materials, so notes for teachers. This might be the answer key. It might be an art, a methodology article for a teacher's journal. Um, it could be uh, tips on how to you do certain activities in the classroom. And there you're writing for the teacher. So the voice of your materials is very different. And it's really important when we're thinking about, I'm gonna write a certain sort of material is to think, who is my audience? Who am I writing this for? Am I writing it just for the students? Am I writing it for the teacher and the students? Or am I writing it just for the teacher? 
because it will change the way you write the material. So this is really kind of basic principles. Um, but often people don't come from that starting point and you need to think about it. Tip number two, there are certain basic principles and they're basic principles that should be taught on teacher training courses, but are not taught. Let me give you an example. Here's, um, here's an exercise that a teacher has written. Now, for me, it's a badly written exercise. It contains mistakes, things that need fixing. Really simple mistakes, but I see it all the time and teachers could fix it. Just have a look at the, the exercise on the screen and in the chat, just write in one or two things that you notice that are wrong with this exercise. How could you instantly improve it? I'll give you a minute or so to think about this because you just need to read, think about it, and then just put in what mistakes. It could be turned into a paragraph rather than sentences. Yeah, there's no variation in the pronouns, Adrienne. It's all I, first person. The questions need numbering. Thank you, Stephen. Basic principle, it's for classroom management to number them but it's amazing how often I see materials that don't have numbers or good numbering. Anything else you might add? Yeah, there's no context, Chi. That's right. Context would make it feel more authentic. We could include pictures. Thank you, Rachel. Number one, the first one could have an example answer so students know exactly what needs to go in. Anything else you might improve on in this exercise? It's a basic gap fill, really useful, but the, but the materials writer could just improve it in one or two ways. So we've had some interesting things, pictures, uh, Bavna, rubrics and verbs. You could use different colors. We'll come on to color and design later. Um, but certainly the rubric, what we call the instruction line at the beginning is really badly written. I think. Not really badly written, but it could be improved where it says complete these sentences in the past, simple and present perfect using the verb in brackets. If I'm writing this for students, I think that's, that could be problematic, yeah. Um, Rachel, does it help for dyslexic students? Yeah, there's a, uh, where we've put the, the verb in brackets, you could put it before the gap, which can help dyslexic students. I made a video on this topic. I'll give you the link afterwards. Marjorie, yeah, we could increase the challenge if the verbs were put in a box. So we could change the level of the task. Yep. Yeah. Um, Bavna's commented there's two sentences and only one idea in the rubric. Yeah, let's take a look. So here's my rewritten exercise. Um, and this is how I think we could improve this exercise in quite basic ways. These are basic principles. But once you've learned them, it becomes really easy and systematic. Um, so at the top, typically, I like titles and subheadings in my materials. Why? Because if I put this on a worksheet and I give it to a student and they do the exercise, they then put it in the bottom of their bag and they forget about it. And days later, they pull out the piece of paper and say, what was this? Well, if it has a title or a subheading, it reminds them what the lesson was about. The other thing is titles and subheadings are good for navigation. They help us find our way around the material. If we just have a series of exercises, it's quite hard to read. And if you look at well-designed course books, for example, from publishers, you'll see lots of titles and subheadings used. Uh, Bhavna mentioned the rubrics, what we call the instruction, the rubric line or the instructions. In American publishing, they call it a direction line. Uh, in British publishing, it's called a rubric, but it's basically the instructions. And I commented the instruction line was very long. It's better to just separate it, maybe just have two short sentences or one sentence if you can. Otherwise, you start to use language 
that's higher level than the actual exercise. Sometimes I read rubrics which have relative clauses in or lots of conjunctions, and that's really problematic. Uh, example sentence, um, I think uh, Rachel mentioned putting an example as number one, and you notice we've now included the numbering. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a classroom management issue. If it helps the teacher say, what's the answer to number two? which makes it all a lot quicker and you can easily write answer keys. Common sense, but we often forget it. Um, somebody pointed out the fact that the previous exercise only used the pronoun I, so always in your head check, have I covered all the pronouns? Have I tested all the different verb forms if it's this type of exercise? Um, the first exercise only included affirmative statements. Um, what, what it didn't test was question forms, and it also didn't question negatives. So in your mental checklist, when you're writing this sort of exercise, you need to say, I've covered statements, but have I co covered questions and negatives as well, if that was part of the grammar presentation. So it was important to include that. Um, personalization, Adriana just mentioned personalization and it's one of my final points, Adriana. The problem with a lot of these exercise types is they don't include that opportunity for personalization. They don't take the student from the control practice to the free practice. And I see this a lot in materials design. And this comes back to the idea of this kind of exercise is almost for self-study. But if I want it to work in the classroom, I need to include some element of personalization or some aspect of communication. So what I've done with this exercise, I've given them control practice from one to seven. And then I've said to the students, now think of your own question, personalize it. And then I can tell the students, get into pairs and ask each other your questions. So I've taken material that is self-study and I've turned it into in-class materials through personalization. So personalization, particularly important there, um, just to make it an in-class piece of material. My final comment would possibly, it would benefit from some contextualization, maybe add an image. So our students are very visual these days. They, they have visual input all the time. And to make something attractive and appealing, it needs an image adding to it. So we might add an image. And then there's the comments you put in the chat about other things you might add. We could turn it into a paragraph. We could make it into a complete text, make it more authentic. But those are the kind of basic principles that are always running through my head when I write any exercise like this. That I almost don't think about it nowadays, but I think it's something that certainly when we're just starting out in teaching or we're writing materials for the first time, they're easy things to forget. And we constantly need to remind ourselves um, about that. OK, so that was that was sort of tip number two, but there were a, a few tips in there. Um, so but hopefully when you next write your gap for exercise, you can think about that. The last point I mentioned was, should we include an image? And selecting images um, is an important skill. Um, whenever we write a piece of material, it's important that we, probably important that we include images, possibly because we're giving students an image to teach them. So if I want to teach an item of vocabulary, I can include, include a picture of that item of vocabulary, particularly if it's a noun or an object in some way. But images also add context. And how we make our, choose our images is particularly important. For example, there's a couple of images here. And if I wanted to teach activity words like playing football, playing soccer, or cooking, cooking dinner or whatever, I could use these images because they show the activity very clearly. 
I also need to consider certain things about image choices because I want my images to reflect my students. Now, I've chosen these two images in particular because 20 years ago, if you'd picked up English language teaching material, you probably would have seen a man playing football and a woman cooking the dinner. And it's only in recent years that you've been able to get pictures of women playing soccer and men cooking. Um, and in these days, we're thinking about diversity and inclusion and reflecting the real lives of our students. And it's, it's almost like when we find photographs from image banks like Shutterstock, for example, I don't know where you get your images from, um, but sometimes it can be quite hard to find the right kind of image. In the chat, tell me where you normally get your images from. Um, these two, for example, came from Getty um, because they were bought by a publisher. I think one of the interesting things is when you go to the image bank, you get a picture of the girl and the, the, the man and the woman doing different activities, but they're both very white. They look white, they look middle class, and we possibly want to look around for images that will show people from different parts of the world or images that reflect our students. A lot of you are putting in the names of, yeah, well-known uh, places to get your, um, and I've mentioned them, some of their Unsplash is very nice because it's free and the images tend to be quite varied. Comp Fight is a nice one, Pixabay. Creative Commons is very good because Creative Commons is where the person who created the image gives their permission for it to be used. And a new feature on Creative Commons is the image finder. If you Google Creative Commons, go to it, there's an image finder and you type in the image you want and Creative Commons generates images where the photographer has given the permission for their image to be used. So it's a nice resource. You can also use Google Images, but, but if you're gonna choose images and then possibly publish it, you need to be familiar with the advanced settings function. If you click on advanced setting in Google Images, you can set it to find images where the copyright is free. So you're staying within sort of within the law. These things are, are increasingly important these days. Um, and, and on my YouTube channel, there's actually a video I made about looking for images online and also finding images that are diverse and inclusive. Um, so I'll give you the link again at the end for that if you're interested in finding a, a wider variety of images that are also uh, legal to use. Notice also all three pictures are in colour. And colour is fine for visual interest. It's also useful when you're teaching words like playing soccer, cooking, that kind of thing. But if you want an image that's going to get students to think more critically and more creatively um, and to engage them, often black and white can work better because you remove the colour and the brain focuses um, on what's really going on in the image. And the other thing is to find images that naturally ask questions. When I'm writing course books and so on, if I'm looking for an image to start the unit off with or to engage students, I'm looking for an image that naturally asks questions. So I'm showing you an image at the moment of three women. If you were going to use this as a lead in to a lesson, can you think of one question you might ask your students and just write it in the chat box? What question do you think this picture naturally asks? How is communication different between the generations? Yeah, I mean, I think the image is really nice on the topic of generations and so on. Who's the better communicator? Nice one, Marjorie. Yeah, what are they talking about? Yeah, Ava, you're predicting what they're saying. What's the dialogue? Why are they sitting on the bench? What are they waiting for? Yeah, where are they? 
Uh, what ha- yeah, what were they doing before this, Bavna? That's a nice question to look at the picture and think what happened before, but also what might happen next. Yeah. Uh, the technology, I think, yeah, see them, it's a good picture for talking about technology, generations, communications. Marjorie said, what's the relationship between the two older women? Do they know each other? Have they never met before? What's the relationship between them, Stephen says? Do they know each other? Yeah, I mean, all of these things, there's the topic of generations, of technology, of communication. I like a picture that does this. The other thing about questions with pictures is to think about the questions we ask, which are lower order thinking questions, like checking questions. So we might ask questions, where are they? Who can you see? What are they holding? Those three questions are very much checking students have the vocabulary to talk about the picture. Naturally, pictures are useful for teaching vocabulary, um, and we can ask questions to check students' understanding. So they're kind of the lower order thinking questions. But we need to ask those questions to either teach vocabulary, also check students have the vocabulary to talk about it. But then a really good image will also encourage higher order thinking questions, which some of you put in the chat box, and I put up three more you might ask, which are encouraging critical thinking and encouraging creative thinking. Because the last one, can you write, um, can you write three questions for one of the women? You're getting students to, to think creatively. Um, as well as critically, and also using their basic, uh, and answering those basic questions. And the nice thing about this is you can use the picture in one lesson and use it to teach vocabulary, and then you can bring the same photograph back to the next lesson and ask those higher order thinking questions. So what you're doing is getting more life from the image you're using. You're making the material work harder. And as teachers, we spend a lot of time creating materials. So you need to design materials that really will work hard for you um, and, and, and have served more than one function. And the nice thing about images, they're great for memory as well. So if you have the image in one class and you bring it to the next class, the image triggers students' memory and helps them remember words that you've taught in the previous lesson. So really think about, and uh, for example, unsplash is good for this type of photo um, because it tends to include photos that are slightly more abstract or, or real life or authentic. The other thing I would suggest is just taking your own photos. It's so easy now to take a photo with your phone that I often just take photographs that I see of things in my everyday life that I think, well, that's quite a nice image to bring into the classroom at some point or use in my material. The other thing is on the issue of selecting images, I would also say uh, another a tip that all writers need to develop is to write effective questions. <coughs> now, what you can see on the screen here is a page from my book uh, called Etpedia. I'm just holding it up to the screen. Uh, this is a resource book that I wrote for teachers uh, with a thousand ideas in it. It's basically got a hundred units on different topics related to, um, to teaching. And in one of the units, I've got 10 different questions you can ask with a picture. So what you can see on the screen there um, are 10 categories of, of, picture, of question. And the early categories, the descriptive questions, the people questions or the activity, they're kind of lower order thinking questions. But the later ones, like comparison in number seven, predicting and speculating in number eight and so on, they're more critical thinking. And then number 10, reusing the image is encouraging more creative thinking. So we go from kind of lower order to higher order thinking questions. And as material writers, we need to develop the skill of writing questions that are both good for lower order thinking and higher order thinking. Also, a little side tip, as a materials writer, I really like making lists. 
So around me, I collect lists of things that I can use again. So I built up this list of questions over time, and I can use these questions with virtually any type of picture. So whenever I'm writing my materials, if I find a picture, I can refer to this list of 10 types of questions and think, okay, I, I can use that type of question here or that type of question. So collect lists like these. I have other lists. Um, and I'm going to share you a link to something that will give you more lists. For example, different ways of doing gap fill questions, different, um, different types of reading comprehension questions. Build up your lists to make your life easier as a materials writer. Anyway, those are just some suggestions of questions. OK, we're, do we're doing OK for time. We're on to tip number five, level, writing to level. This is one of the biggest challenges for teachers, I think, is, is when you take a text or any type of material, it could be a listening text, a reading text, a video text, and adjusting it for the level. I'm assuming everybody is familiar with CFR levels, so we go from A1 to C2. Um, although these were created for a European framework, they seem to have virtually gone around the world. Um, but basically, A1 is sort of beginner elementary, and it goes up to A2, B1, pre-intermediate, B1, B2 is intermediate, B2 is sort of upper intermediate, C1 is advanced, and C2 is proficient. And learning to write text for the level is, is a real challenge, and there's different ways of doing it. Let's, um, but there are tools out there that will help you. So if I imagine that we were going to do a lesson about the weather, OK? Here's my text. Now, I've taken this text from um, an article in National Geographic magazine. It was about extreme weather. So this was written for C1, C2 level readers. But imagine if I wanted to rewrite this for a B1 learner, just looking at the text, which vocabulary in the text do you think would be challenging for B1 students? If you were going to use this text, which words might you rewrite or have to pre-teach before students actually read the text? Just have a read. So droughts, Demetra. Yeah, droughts might be a tough word. And also students would, would need help with pronunciation of it, probably. Uh, saw. Saw is actually a C1 level word, Amanda. Yeah. Frequently might be. It might be. Hit, possibly. Fair share of. Yeah, nice chunk there. And that highlights from Marjorie. We've got this idea there's vocabulary that's high level, but there's chunks of words. Uh, like heat waves, Mariana's written as well, would, would be challenging for possibly for B, B1 students. We'd also have to think about the context of our students because this article is about different types of extreme weather in different countries. And if students have no experience of those other countries or no experience of certain types of weather, that's actually really quite hard for them to conceptually understand what this text is about. So sometimes the problem is not the level of the vocabulary in terms of CFR, it's just the actual context and the setting. So we may need to help students with that. People are still, yeah, nice chunk there from Marjorie, burn out of control, a record high. It's interesting, isn't it? Because if with the word record and high, Separately, they're not particularly high level words, but together, they're actually more difficult. Um, so we have to th really think about the chunks of it. Now, there are tools that will help you these. In the past, I would have looked at a text like this and rewritten it based very much on my own intuition and a dictionary. Um, but there are tools online that are free. I'm sure some of you use these, but you can copy the text put it into one of these tools and it will analyze the text for you in terms of level. Um, I personally use Oxford Text Checker a lot because I write for Oxford University Press and it's free and I can quickly check uh, the level of vocabulary in the text. 
Uh, English vocabulary profile from Cambridge is also very good. And Cambridge also have a similar text checking tool for grammar. Marjorie, there's the GSE teacher toolkit from Pearson is another good one to look at. Yep. Um, and most of these tools are sort of free. And even if you're quite experienced at looking at level of text, it's a really quick and easy way to check your intuition. So I took the text I showed you and I've put it through the Oxford text checker. And there you can see the words in blue are A1 level, um, but a word like extreme comes out of A2. Uh, a word like hurricane is B1, frequently is B1. Um, if you go down, the word saw is C1. Uh, Maria Jose has mentioned another one called road to grammar. I'm not familiar with that one, Maria. I'll take a look. Thank you. Um, the word like droughts, which came up, that's a B2 level word. So our intuition in the chat was pretty good. We, we picked out the words above the B1 level. I think the other interesting thing about this kind of text is you can analyze it for vocabulary, but you've also got to analyze it for sentence structure. For example, if a text has relative clauses in it, um, um, but I'm using a text, say, with A2 or B1, I would rewrite it to not have the relative clauses if I hadn't taught them to students. Uh, Rachel, good question. I can't remember why the words are underlined in there. Uh, there's some, some issue on Oxford Text Checker. Oxford Text Checker has other functions. It will analyze, give you the results. It will also take a text and create an automatic gap fill with it. So if you click on Activities, um, it will create the gap fill for you. So it will remove some of, the, some of the work. You can just put the text in, click on it, and it will create the gap fill. So go and play with it. Google Oxford Text Checker. Um, and it has all sorts of interesting functionality. It's not an absolute solution. It will only give you the level of vocabulary. It's not every part of it. Sometimes you'll need to rewrite a text uh, in other ways, like sentence structure. Uh, sometimes I, I, I include extra words like discourse markers that I want to include, like, for example, in addition to. However, if I've been trying to teach that vocabulary, I might add that into the text as well. Um, but text checkers help you develop the skill of identifying level. Um, so they're, they're a really they're one of the real benefits of these kinds of online tools. So take a look and play with them. And on my YouTube channel, um, I've got a video about using these kind of text checking tools. OK, let's crack on. Number six, as material writers, we are writing material, but sometimes we need to be designers. Um, we need to think about the layout and the format. Um, one thing that's really affected this is online teaching and the fact that our students are no longer just looking at a page in a book. They might be looking at a tablet, a laptop, on their mobile phone, and that affects the design and the layout of our materials. So we need to think about this carefully. And it's quite basic things. For example, on the screen, you can see an exercise that I wrote for students to help them uh, with online communication. So they were given five problems and they had to match the problem to a chunk of language to help them. It was helping students who were communicating with online platforms like Zoom, for example. Now I designed it like this, but actually for many of my students, if they're looking at it on a laptop, it's better actually to design it in landscape. So the one on the left is in portrait, the one on the right is in landscape. It makes more sense to design your materials in landscape. I think because we've been writing for paper and books for so long, we automatically write our exercises in portrait. But landscape might be more effective. And the other thing to consider is if we have students working with their mobile phones, we've got to reduce the amount of content on the screen. So in the third example, I've removed the instructions. I've put an example line 
from 1 to D so students know exactly what I'm doing and then they can read the rest of the text. But all of these, these different screen sizes have added this element of design that now we really have to think about as materials writers. Um, because lots of materials aren't suitable, say, for a mobile phone screen. We've got to rethink it. The other thing to consider is the design, but also the accessibility of materials. Quite often, as materials writers and teachers, we get a bit excited when we create a new piece of material. And a colleague of mine called Emily Bryson uh, does a lot of work in this area of design and accessibility. And I interviewed her on my YouTube channel. Uh, she gave me this example. So here's an example of a reading comprehension that a teacher has created. Um, if, what, what do you think is wrong with the design of that material? Just tell me in the chat box what you, what you think the materials writer has done wrong. The, the text is on top of the picture. It's hard to read. Visibility, the font color, it's color. It's too busy, as Janet says, the color of the text. There's different fonts, different font sizes. Italics, yes, yeah, Stephen, for dyslexic students, for example, italics are really quite difficult. For students who have colorblind issues, um, who have problems seeing colors, um, it's problematic. Um, yes, image and text on steroids, Demetra. Now, we joke about this, but these, these mistakes are really common in materials because we all get excited about it. We've got to include lots of photographs and make it very visual. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a problem. And what um, Emily suggested was here would be perhaps a way to improve it. So what she's done there is shift the photo out the way. So you've still got the photo adding the vis visible impact, um, but now the text is separate and she's got rid of a lot of the colors. I still think there's a problem there with the italics. I wouldn't necessarily have the text in italics. I'd probably maybe use a slightly different font. But notice she's also applied principles. She's got the lettering, the numbering. She's using bold in a very simple way. She's got the instruction or the rubric line in bold. Um, so it, it's much easier to read. Possibly the image could be slightly bigger than that. And also the background is very plain. It's not stark white, which I often use because I prefer it as a reader. A lot of it's to do with what you yourself find accessible. Um, but this, this makes the text um, more inclusive for more types of people, and particularly people with sort of uh, reading difficulties like um, dyslexia. These things are important to consider as, as writers, and, and, and sometimes we don't, or we go a bit crazy with the colours and so on. Okay. Tip number seven, maybe after a while as a writer, you've been um, creating your own materials for your students. And then you reach the stage where you want to share your materials and possibly you want to publish it. But you have this desire to give your material to other teachers to use. And if the real test of good material actually is when you can hand it to another teacher and say, hey, this works in my lesson, do you want to try it? And the teacher goes off and tries it. Now, we call, in publishing, we call this piloting the material. And it's really important that when we write a piece of material, we test it. So sometimes I like to go back in the classroom and test the material. But if I really want to know if it works, I give it to another teacher and ask them for feedback. And if you want to do that, find a teacher who's going to be honest with you. You don't just want to give it to a friend who says, yeah, it's fine. What you want is, is really good sort of um, uh, uh, critical feedback. You know, tell me what's good about it, but tell me what I need to change. Um, so sharing and publishing your materials is a great way to develop as a writer. And it doesn't have to be... Um, Chi, do you have a form for evaluation? I'll give you a link to something at the end that will help you with uh, evaluating materials. 
Uh, and maybe some other people have it in the chat box, have some suggestions on that. But um, so sharing it with other teachers and, and then and, and think about getting it published. Now, you might be quite nervous about getting something published, but it doesn't have to go to a publisher and become a course book. For example, um, a person that I worked with on a training course called Sylvina has a website called EF, EFL Creative Ideas. And basically, Sylvina is a teacher in Spain. She creates worksheets uh, and she shares those worksheets on a blog. And actually, a lot of people now follow Sylvina because she shares her worksheets for free. Um, they've got a great level of professionalism. She includes answer keys um, and different ways of using them. Uh, and visually, she, spent, she makes them look really good. And by having the blog, she's really improved her material writing skills. And she's got the pleasure of knowing that other teachers use those materials. Another way to share and publish your materials is to publish them in journals. Now, most people have teacher organizations in their own country that publish uh, magazines, newsletters, or maybe they have an online blog. They're always looking for articles and ideas for teach from teachers it's a great way to go public. Um, I'm putting up the magazine Modern English Teacher because I've had a long association with it and a colleague of mine called Bob McClarty, he's the editor. He loves receiving articles from teachers. The great thing about a, a magazine like Modern English Teaching is that you get editorial feedback, um, which means you send in your work and then somebody gives you feedback and they might ask you to rewrite or change certain things, but it's a great way to get experience. The other thing about Modern English Teacher is they pay you some money. Not a lot, but it means you're getting paid for your material. So it's something else to consider. I'll also give you a link to the end. If you're interested in self-publishing, actually publishing a book with Amazon Create, I'll give you a link to a video at the end that will help you. And Rachel says, yes, it's full of great teaching ideas. Aside from getting published, the magazine itself has lots of really good ideas. Go to the website and uh, take a look. It's, it's also got a great digital resource where you can sign up and get lots of past articles as well. If you share and publish your... Um, if you share and publish your materials, you need to go to what I call step eight, which is understand how other people will use your materials. When you write your own material, you can probably make it work because you've written it uh, and you know when you're writing it, you're thinking, how am I gonna use it in the class? When you give it to another teacher to use, it's different because te not all teachers teach like you. Every teacher teaches differently. It's very interesting um, to talk to teachers about how they use materials. I did some research sometime back where I interviewed teachers about what they thought of the role of a course book was for them. So I was going to create another course book and I thought, well, how do teachers use my course books? Now, earlier in this talk, I showed you the relationship between the learner, teacher, and materials. Um, and if we think about the role of those three things, um, we've got learners, and their role are co-workers, explorers, receiver, risk-taker. The teacher is the facilitator, the expert, the performer, the resource. But it's interesting to think about what is the role of the material in a teacher's life. So in the chat, what words would you, if you were thinking of a course book that you use or a piece of published material that you use, what words would you use to describe the role of that material? What words come to mind? Context, stimulus, support, yeah, it's a tool, yeah. Any other words? Got two people writing tools. Springboard, Janet, that's a nice word. A bridge, Bavna, like it. Bridge, yeah. Gives you structure, doesn't it, Stephen? It gives you a framework. It's a resource. Assistant, it facilitates you, yep. 
Um, but every teacher will see the material differently. So when you're writing materials and you're giving it to another teacher, they will not use it in the same way necessarily that you wrote it. Let me share you three. When I did this study, I got three different types of answer. Um, and, and these are quite representative of three different types of teach. So teacher A would describe the course book as a kind of backbone or a framework. They're the sort of teacher that uses, opens the course book, they do exercise one and two, they miss out exercise three and four, they go to five, they do six and seven, they miss out eight, maybe they bring in something else that they've created and then they finish the material. So they're not, they're using your material, but they're not using all of it. There's teacher B, and teacher B expects the material to make the lesson flow. Now, typical teacher B will open the course book and do exercise one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They'll do everything and they won't create their own material. They'll just want the material to do the job for them. Teacher C, they don't use published course books that much. They treat it as a springboard. It gives them ideas. So when they open the book, they might see an image and think, oh, I'll ask some different questions. Or they might look at a reading text, but they create their own questions for it, from it. And they'll just dip into the material, which means when you write materials and you give it to different teachers, they'll all use it in different ways. Uh, you might want to put in the chat box, which of the teacher do you think you are? Are you teacher A, B or C? Your answers will vary, possibly. Um, some of you will be A, you use it as a kind of framework. Some of you will be C. Uh, I, uh, and it will change. Chi says it's mixed. I remember when I first started teaching, I was teacher B because I wanted lots of help. Then I became teacher C. I started creating lots of my own materials. And now I would say I'm kind of teacher A. I use published materials and then I bring in other materials that I write as well. As a materials writer, your job, I think, is to write for teacher B. If you're writing for other teachers, you need to think of everything that a teacher needs. Because if you write for teacher A and you provide everything like answer keys, listening scripts, um, guidance on how to use it, and very clear instructions, you're helping teacher B, which means that teacher A and teacher C can also use the materials. But you want to write, you want to have teacher B in your mind when you write materials. You might not be teacher B, but, but you need to write for them. Um, that's why piloting materials is useful. That's why observing teachers, if you get the chance to observe other teachers and observe teachers using your materials, it's so useful because you see the way a teacher works with your material. So if you lend your material to teachers, ask if you can observe their lessons as well. And it's really interesting because I've seen teachers use my materials in ways that I never expected. It's a really interesting thing to, to try out. But think about this when you write for other people. The other thing uh, when you write for other teachers is that suddenly instructions become really important or rubrics. Now, we talked about this earlier the need to make instructions kind of simple. The reason is partly for the students, but it's also partly for teachers. If you want teachers to use your materials, they've got to be clear. For example, here is a badly written rubric or instruction. Tell me in the chat box what is bad about the instruction and can you improve it? Can you rewrite it? Just tell me in the chat what's wrong with it. And, how, and maybe have a go at rewriting. It's much too long, Chi. Yep. So what can we do to make it easier to read? It's a horrible long sentence, Morag. Yeah. Break it into steps. We could number the steps, shorter sentences. We could get rid of the conjunctions. It's got a relative clause in it. So it all needs breaking down.
Uh, we could change the font as well. Yeah, we could have numbering. One rubric, one verb. That's a nice rule, Bavner. If you've got an instruction, it should just be subject, verb, object quite often. Um, and no more than that. Sometimes you can have a conjunction like and, but try to keep it simple. Uh, here I've rewritten it um, because that's basically what's happening in that instruction. There are two steps. The problem for the materials writer is they put two separate activities into one instruction. Actually, it's two separate steps. Um, and I'll see this mistake even in course books. It amazes me when I see rubrics that are too long like this and haven't been split down and the, the writer hasn't scaffolded it into short sentences. So, um, and that will really impact on a lesson, particularly when you write materials for other teachers. Okay, and finally, my last tenth tip is resources on materials writing. A lot of you have asked me for links to things. Um, there's a book I showed you earlier. Um, this book, Etpedia, with questions to use with images, but there's also an Etpedia on materials writing um, that I wrote with Lindsay Clanfield, who's another author, uh, and it's basically 500 ideas and tips for people to write materials uh, for their own lessons. And they include lists, so 10 types of reading comprehension questions, 10 ways to use video, uh, 10 ways to create board games, uh, 10 ways to create crosswords and so on. Um, you can get a Kindle version, so you don't have to order the hard copy. Uh, and also Pavilion ELT who published it, are offering 20% discount at the moment, uh, which I think is available till the end of February. You can get any of the ETP titles, so you could order the materials writing book and get 20% off. Uh, if you don't have the money at the moment, that's fine. You could also go to my YouTube channel uh, where I've made a selection of videos. Uh, for example, uh, on the screen there, one, one video is how to self-publish a profitable book. I interview uh, a, an English teacher who self-published their own book and is making quite a lot of money uh, from the book they've written. So if you're interested in how to self-publish, uh, it's a 30-minute interview, and I talk to him about how he went self-publishing the book. You'll also see other ideas, for example, how to design online materials, how to find images on the internet, um, how to use those text checkers. So in the video, I look at different text checking tools and assess them and talk about how they work. Um, also, there's an interview with Emily Bryson about creating accessible learning materials. So the two images I showed you of the image of the badly designed material and the better designed material that comes from my interview with uh, Emily. You can see the video there. So it's a nice free resource. Take a look um, and it'll give you lots of help. And there's other things like how do you use, how do you create crosswords in your materials? How do you write a gap fill? Um, so the slide I showed you where I improved the gap fill, uh, I talk about that in one of the videos if you want to go back and have a look at it. Um, and obviously, if you've got any other questions, you can contact me via my website, John Hughes ELT. Okay, which brings me to the end. I'm going to finish. Uh, we've got about five minutes. If anybody um, has got any questions, and Rachel has discovered the secret meaning of the, uh, of the underlined text of the text checker. Thank you, Rachel. Any more questions or comments or issues you want to raise, either related to what I've spoken about, if you've got a specific question about materials writing, now is your chance. And we've got some other published authors in the room as well uh, who could probably help out with any questions. So uh, feel free. Thank you so, so very much, uh, John, for this wonderful session on materials writing. I really appreciate that. So a while about, Hang on, one uh, moment. Yeah, OK, we've got... A We've, got, we've yep. got a question. Is it profitable to give the topic of an essay with an image? Uh, it depends what your essay is about. When you say an essay, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, but if it's an essay about 
teaching in some way, you could send it to Modern English Teacher. They might be interested in it. Um, Chi, advised about brief process for material writing and publishing. If you watch the video on how to self-publish a book um, on my YouTube channel, that will give you, because there isn't a brief answer to it, to be honest. Um, there's, um, the, the, it's quite a long process. So take a look, Chi, at the thing on my YouTube channel where I'm talking about um, how to self-publish if you're talking about self-publishing or publishing with a magazine, then have a look at the Modern English Teacher website, for example. But if you're thinking about sending your material to a publisher, it's quite rare these days that a big publisher will, um, will publish you if they receive uh, the materials. Normally, they commission the materials. The best way to start is to start sending your material to a teacher's magazine, for example. Um, how do you improve your writing skills? You, did, you, you need to write materials, and the, big, the best way to improve writing skills is give your materials to other teachers and get feedback from them. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate your time. I think we've come to the end, so I'll hand back to Am uh, Amunala. Thanks very much, uh, John. It was wonderful to have you at Teacher Development Webinars. I really appreciate uh, your time and expertise. So I was monitoring the chat on YouTube. We have some questions if you could, uh, you know, we could ask. Sorry, what could you repeat that? Yeah, there are some questions on YouTube too. So if I could, uh, you know, put them into you. Nargis, okay, yeah, Nargis from Com Iran asks that uh, could you talk about uh, the idea of localization and the issue of authenticity? Localization and the issue of what? Authenticity in the materials. Okay. Um... I mean, if you're writing materials for a local, in a local setting, uh, the issue of personalization is important. But I also think um, in terms of authenticity is to get authentic photos or photos that reflect the students that you're teaching. Also, if you're writing uh, for a, a local context, is uh, lots of countries have... Um, news in English um, that's reported in English and so I would go to local newspapers that are written in English for in a, that are with topics about the country that the students are from so for example at the moment I'm working on some materials for um, Middle East students so I'm looking for texts and topics from the Middle East region, so that the materials are about them. I think in the past, English course books often used to be uh, have texts and images about England or about the USA, uh, and more and more they're including texts um, about different countries. That's certainly true of books from National Geographic Learning, who I write for. We look for articles and texts um, about different regions in the world. So don't be afraid of, of looking locally for your context. And if you can't find a text in English about a local issue, just write the text yourself. I think lots of teachers worry about authentic English. I think the issue is authentic information. Uh, use authentic images and write text about authentic real information because students will google if you give them a text about a topic they'll then google that the, the information to see if it's real and for me that that authenticity is more important than always worrying about is the english from an authentic source if if you write the material yourself um it's authentic as far as i'm concerned wonderful so another question was, if I want to study or take a course on course design, material design or curriculum development, uh, where could I start? Uh, you could contact me. I run a course for Oxford University in the summer. Um, 
It, it's usually every summer in July. I'm not sure if we're running one this year. We also run a face-to-face -face course where students come to Oxford, but for the last two years, we've run it as an online course. Um, so if you're interested in doing a course with me in materials writing where we cover a lot more issues, uh, you, could, you could contact me via my website, johnhuseylt.com. Uh, Fernando's Fernando asked a question about using materials appropriately. That's really a teacher training question. Um, when you're sharing your materials, you can't control how your materials will be used. It goes back to the point I made about how teachers use materials. You write the materials, you give them away, and then how they're used after that is out of your control. But what you can do is make sure that they're written in a way to, that the teacher will produce decent lessons. The importance possibly is to write good teacher's notes. So when you write a worksheet with exercises, write a set of notes for the teacher with it that has the answer key, the listening scripts, and tips on how to use the material. And that way you're helping the teacher use the materials, but possibly develop their, list, their, their teaching skills. Lots of teachers around the world get a lot of their teacher training and development from using good teachers' books. But, but you have to accept that you can't control what happens in the classroom, Fernando. That's not your job. Great. Maybe one, uh, just one last question. How to get into ELT material writing profession from Jihad, she's from Egypt. How to get it, sorry, from where? Yeah, she asked that how to get into ELT material writing profession. Okay, uh, well, like I suggested, start sharing your materials, start giving your materials to other teachers. You could create a blog. So take a look at the blog that I showed you, EFL Creative Ideas from Sylvina and see what she's done. Start sending your materials to journals like Modern English Teacher. Um, if you're interested in approaching a publisher, I would begin by looking at what the publisher does in your country. So if you're based in a country like Pakistan, Oxford University Press, for example, publishes material in Pakistan. I'd, as to a teacher in Pakistan, I'd recommend they find out who's in charge of publishing in Pakistan and see if you can get involved that way because a lot of publishing now happens at a very local level, and that's a good way to get into um, publishing that way. And go to teachers' conferences. You, materials writers who want to publish also have to be good networkers. You have to advertise yourself, and you need to go and talk to people and find out who the people are who are commissioning. Um, as a materials writer, you've got to run yourself a bit like a business or a bit like an entrepreneur. You've got to get to know the right people. Um, that's a fact of life. That isn't just in teaching and materials writing. That's true of anything. Okay. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks very much, John. Any final words for our teachers at Teacher Development Webinars audience? Well, just thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to you for organizing it. Thank you to Teacher Development Webinars. It's great stuff that you're doing, that you're offering this to teachers who wouldn't normally have access to um, this kind of content. So I'm happy to, to take part. And uh, thank you all for spending an hour with me. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your presence here with, uh, with us. Uh, thanks very much for attending, everyone. So for our future webinars, uh, you can follow us on our, our social media channels. We're available on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. And this recording will also be in place at Teacher Development Webinars YouTube channel for your future reference. If you want certificate for this session, you can contact at info.edwebinars at the rate of uh, gmail.com. From and this weekend, Saturday, we are starting International Mother Language Day webinar series in accordance with, you know, that will go for a whole of February and uh, I'll appreciate if you could join us for the session on Saturday we have session with Professor Sarah Thompson from Michigan University so yeah hope to see you there till then goodbye take care bye 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 everyone